sideline, we'll say, well, you know, not a uh, They came out and they joined us. By the time we got to the front, we were about the biggest organization there. You know, there were hundreds, <laughs> hundreds, at least a hundred with us. But that, uh, I remember that very vividly. And yeah, those were wonderful demonstrations. The, the feeling uh, amongst the group was really very positive. Just very positive, and uh, I don't know if any of the people who joined us later joined up, but but it, it started with sixteen or seventeen people. I think when I left, it was about eighty-seven people, and then the person that followed me maybe added a, a mm -hmm. few more. And then after that, the person that followed us by then the attitude had now had changed to the point where they decided to, uh, and Capitol Hill the chapter met at a hospital. It was easy to get to. They had a nice little. It was a Sunday, too. And uh, so then the attitudes have changed so that somebody, now two or three officers beyond me, decided that they would, you know, consolidate into the Washington, you know, Washington mm -hmm. yeah. But we were never active in, in Virginia very much, were we? Well, I don't think so, not at all. No, not really. Although, no, although you lived here in Virginia, you lived in Alexandria. And I was active in Capitol Hill now, coming from New York, because I'm still in New York. And um, we met in the New York Now chapter. And John... When it was the only chapter. When it was the only chapter. <laughs> and very active. And he goes back to sitting in the living room with Betty Friedan and the founding of the chapter. So... His involvement is much longer than I yeah. mine. But again, at the time that we were active in, in Capitol Hill, he was president, and I ran for office as treasurer, I think I was. Uh, and I would visit him there many weekends, and on the weekends they had the meetings, I would go and we would do our thing. So you were commuting yeah. down here? Yeah. yeah, with my two Siamese cats in my Volkswagen, and then, you know, going back to what. <laughs> But, but one of the things that happened was, again, John mentioned the shift. In the early 70s, I would say that the focus of the now that I knew was really on the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, and also economic equality. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if John was involved in the big case involving the stewardesses who had to resign or retire once they married. Yes. Okay? Yes. Uh, but that was an issue in those days where economic equality was a very major uh, issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the lavender scare, uh, I think, was a preface to the change, the shift in the policies that now was going after. Um, abortion rights became a significant part, but not really. They left it to the National Abortion Rights League, NARL, to do the, the yeoman's work in that area. And, you know, there was a period of time where we withdrew, retired, uh, because of the shift in the policy. And again, my attitude was, if you don't have economic equality or the opportunity to do whatever you want to do in your profession, get equal pay for equal work, it doesn't matter what you choose to do in your bedroom, okay, yeah. doesn't matter. So there was a change and then we kind of began to withdraw from The change that. was, just to be clear, from which position to which position? From one of Equal Rights Amendment, economic equality, mm -hmm. um, job opportunities, equal pay for equal work, right. that into something which became much more uh, social issues. Mm -hmm. uh, again, to give you an example, Lots of discussion in those conventions at around this time about should we make a big case to change, to focus on herstory and, in, instead of history. His this versus in the later 70s yeah. you're talking about now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Later 70s. Yeah. There was a shift, and, and I thought that the refocus was going to take away from the engine of the arguments. Because again, if you didn't have economic equality, the ERA, Everything else was secondary. Yeah. Well, and for a while, didn't it seem as if there was a great deal of momentum behind the ERA? So ratification. Oh, absolutely. Like, like, like kind of a like we got that wheel was in motion, right? So mm -hmm. other less, shall we say, sort of 
bread and butter issues could be moved on to. That may have been... That may have been part of it, but I, I really think that at a point in time, again, I speculate, the majority of women expending all that energy to get an ERA mm -hmm. uh, realized that it was going to be a bridge too far and they began to refocus. Uh, and we never did get it. Not that I think at the end of the day it would matter because I remember that there is an equal rights amendment in the Japanese constitution and Japanese women are no further to <laughs> economic equality today than they were back at the end of World War II. Yeah. When we put it in there. Yeah, we put it in there. <laughs> well, there have been a number of uh, constitutions since World War II that include you mm -hmm. know, full uh, rights for women, equality for women, and you still have to do the cultural work to make that normal, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, the moment that you're talking about, sort of the late '70s, moving into you know around 1980 and Reagan's election, um, seemed to refocus a lot of people in. Uh, in Virginia and some other places around the ERA because some of the states hadn't ratified Virginia being yeah. one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and are still working on it. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a, a woman who, um, she's the daughter of Katrina Swanson, who was one of the uh, Philadelphia 11, one of the irregularly ordained uh, Episcopal priests, mm -hmm. um, daughter-in-law, sorry. And Helen's life has been very uh, complicated for the last few years, but anyway, she's decided to go on a pilgrimage from San Francisco through all of the unratified states coming up to DC for um, the rally on International Women's Day on March 8th next year. Mm -hmm. And along the way, she's trying to rebuild and re-enliven coalitions in those states, mm -hmm. um, pushing for ratification in places where it hasn't happened. Um, and at the same time, trying to you know lobby people in Congress and say, you know, that deadline, that was really, was a bit of cheat. <laughs> That deadline. Um, we, know, we saw that. We saw you do that. Um, well, so yeah. there's still, you know, some momentum. A little bit of yeah, and and a woman who's literally walking on her own two feet all the way across the country, trying to push that energy again, and it's working. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeing people wake up and get busy as she moves through. Um, but are these so. younger women? Um, some are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some are. Um, there's been a long legacy from. Uh, the lavender scare uh, that has traced its way all the way down to the present day, which mm -hmm. is that um, in the Equal Rights Amendment fight, um, now just almost entirely, um, is considered um, a white middle class women's, straight yeah. women's movement. Um, and that, despite the fact that, you know, people in my generation have started to work to dismantle that attitude mm -hmm. and dismantle some of that um, fear. Uh, it's it's a hard thing to fight. Um, there because, have been it, that, because historically, that's what it was. I mean, remember, my attitude: this is the junior league. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. And part of what hap I mean happens not just in the women's movement, but from time to time in the progressive movement is, you know, there's a, there's a there's an issue, there's a push to deal with it, and some minority group or other insists on coming along, insists on expanding the agenda to include their needs that are related to that issue. And every once in a while, you know, the, the white middle class or whoever's leading that movement says, mm -hmm. that will scare off the politicians and the business leaders and we can't do your thing right now. Mm -hmm. and what happens historically is we break alliance, we break yeah. faith, and you don't get it back. You don't get it back very easily. Yeah. Um, and so we're still trying to overcome that problem. Um, the thing is that we do have overlapping concerns. Um, across all of these groups, mm -hmm. and um, we can't right now find those places where we overlap and work together because mm -hmm. the, the trust just hasn't been rebuilt yet. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know exactly how to go about it. But, mm -hmm. um, that has is there any connection between, us? say, the human rights movement, the lesbian, gay, transgender movement, and now these days? Not very much. No. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a we have a chapter in Virginia, um, in Richmond, that's much more interested in those kinds of issues, mm -hmm. um, and is made up largely of people from uh, the gay and transgender communities. Um, so they're much more focused on on issues concerning, of course, their membership. Yeah. Um, but most of the state, you know, you don't find that incorporation 
um, across the rest of the chapters in the state. Mm -hmm. um, you don't find as many younger women as we want um, to keep you know the fight up. We have all of this unfinished business, of course. There's no but we're having. But, but, but why do you think that's true? John's got some granddaughters, which we can talk about. But uh, well, I'm kind of a third generation feminist myself, mm -hmm. um, and so sort of third wave. And I. Um, Two, well, two things happen. One, you're talking about now sort of changing its focus, you know, where the policy priorities and the issues are going to be, to things that were more cultural and more social. Mm -hmm. And so right about the time that happens, um, you know, there's this last desperate push for the ERA, but it fails. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous, obviously, uh, a tremendous sense of depression and anger. And fatigue. Women go off to do other things. And fatigue. I yes. Oh, exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Gosh. Um, women go off to do other things. The issue kind of disappears, and the at the same time, women's studies departments in the academy become a more regular thing. Mm -hmm. But because they're academic departments, they're better at doing the social, social and cultural stuff. Mm -hmm. So that kind of becomes what we're learning, right? When my generation um, comes into the university um, in undergrad and graduate school, that's what we are presented, mm -hmm. and. The moment in history that we're sort of working on recording with this project and with Megan's project is that moment between um, sort of 1976 and 1982 um, when the ERA was important, um, mm -hmm. was beginning to flounder, and eventually failed because we gloss over that even in our history books. Mm -hmm. Even in the women's history books, mm -hmm. um, it's sort of, and it ended, and we move on to these other questions. <laughs> and there's no um, detail about that period mm -hmm. uh, because it wasn't a triumph, you know? Yep. History likes to record success. Well, even with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the inclusion of discrimination on the basis of uh, gender was put in with the with the expectation that the act would not pass the South. Right. That was it was a strategy to be a bomb. that yeah. <laughs> that, you know, surprise. It's surprise. Surprise. It's a bomb, right? It does it does shake everything up when you do that. <laughs> and I forget the name of the, the, the man, and was he a senator or a congressman who put that in deliberately for that reason? Yeah, I can't remember. I he was older probably from the South. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesse Helms? No. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> nothing it wasn't, it nothing wasn't surprises. No, 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 no one that was that uh, No, but we did, uh, again, you asked about connections to, to Virginia now. Um, this was a, a demonstration January 22nd. It must have been for Roe versus Wade, I'm not sure. 74. We marched, Capitol Hill marched along with Alexandria now. Oh, cool. You can have those if you like. Oh no, I, I won't okay. take them. I would love to take pictures of them. Oh, here's the now oh, caravan. Because. That's John giving driving uh, instructions on how to get there. <laughs> oh, cool. Getting at Mickey D's. No, I'd love to take pictures. You want to hold off for a minute while she gets us some cheesy wrappers? Sure, yeah. You and more coffee? Video for just a sec. Yeah, I'd love some. And we'll uh, give this a pause. Lee Perkins, uh, who mm -hmm. you know, brought you to us, uh, was in the Capitol Hill chapter of now. Yes, she's mentioned that. She was my very first interview, and it didn't. I didn't have a good plan, so <laughs> I have learned to have a better plan now. <laughs> yeah, I've decided, I'm gonna have to do her over again. <laughs> like Lee, no, we, we did we did it wrong. <laughs> we have to meet and do it again. So we're going to be able to do that one of these days soon. Well, she lived a couple of blocks from here, didn't she, here about? She four. used to, but now she's moved to um, South Alexandria along Highway 1 because of her knees. She's had knee relations. And the person she was living with, uh, her benefactor, kind of passed, passed away. away. Yeah, she, um, she has since moved uh, over to... 
by the Silver Springs. Was oh, it she's over Shady in. Springs? She's moved over to uh, the friendship, one of the friendship communities in Maryland. Oh, okay. um, I thought she was moving down by Richmond Highway somewhere. She did for a while. Um, she was staying with um, uh, Molly Abraham and her husband, and uh, has since found accommodation over on Maryland side. So she drives over here pretty regularly to go see people. She had uh, knee replacement surgery mm -hmm. in wow. July, and is recovering from it. One, I think, so far. But she's recovering from it really quickly. I mean, I'm kind of surprised. I've seen people go through that surgery. And actually do an awful lot of physical therapy for a really long time, so I'm very happy to her. Well, as you grow older, you spend more time with doctors. Yes. A lot of times with appointments. In fact, I'm the only person you ever met who has two pacemakers. Two. No, you don't. <laughs> You must be a time lord and have two hearts. <laughs> no, they installed it. And they installed it in Medtronic's people, checked it, and they said it's not worth the right. Well, so then it, the story is, according to who you're talking to, they say, they are going to take me over and out, put it in one hand, and they rethink it. But they call it, um, it it's something less than, uh, it, but then at that time, I don't know if they went in and connected, reconnected, or what they did, but I had to go, like, stay in the hospital for three days. Mm -hmm. So within two days, I had two of them. Wow. And I'm no fan of the hospital. No, I hear you. I don't like them either. They had what I call Roly Roly Bay. And they had uh, a bed. And every time I tried to drip off the seat, they started rolling from the right. <laughs> so I called the nurse. I had to go to three nurses to find one that could unplug it. I said, can't you unplug this? And he said, no, this thing is very good because it keeps you from getting bed sores. I said, I'm only going to be here one night. I'm not going to get any bed sores one night. <laughs> I just want to get a solid night's sleep. Right. <laughs> and then I found out at about 6 o'clock in the morning, instead of just rolling you from side to side and back and forth, it would just lift you up and down. But I finally found someone, and they told me, they said, well, if you unplug it, it's an inflatable mattress. It'll inflate it and be very hard. I said, thank you. And so the nurse came in and unplugged it. Yeah. The third nurse. Yeah. But uh, somebody sold them that deal. Well, we have mm -hmm. two surgeons who live next door. A breast mm -hmm. surgeon and cardiologist. And the breast surgeon says that bed sores have been known to occur even one night. Yeah. Well, Maybe certain people are more sensitive than others. Some people may bruise easily. That's right. Um, that's true. But usually, if you're just if you're sleeping and you can move yourself in your sleep, you're gonna roll over when you need to. People who are noble, I think, usually end up with a bed well, somewhere. The and you have to leave somebody. Days oh, how cool are these? E R A. You can take those. Oh. In the days when ERA was a very, very prominent issue, they were all bought at now conventions. Yeah, <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah. And this is the now convention in Houston, Texas in 1974. Oh, yes. The story now convention. You can't stop. Are you going to share that with Missy? Where is she? Missy? I'm going to bed. under your feet. Just Missy is a cheese fanatic. Hello. Hey, puppy. Where are you? She's over here. You're Missy. Here you are, babe. Here. Missy. Go on the other side. Go ahead. Come here, Missy. That's it. Missy, Stop look here. Stop looking at me. I don't have anything. <laughs> Missy. I got it. Missy, I'm going to be right here. Missy. No, she's not. I don't have anything. I'm not even trying to feed you. She's trying to get She's like, I'm begging from the stranger. It's what we do. It <laughs> usually works. So, but where were we? We're back on. Yeah, we have cheese and crackers again. We, we were talking about the shift in the focus on the issues and the change and the effect of feminism on young people. Oh, well, yeah. Well, it beca yeah, it became... I don't want to talk about this for too long because it's your stories that we came here to get, but um, it's become a real uh, split. 
and you know, there was sort of a big 